As we go through the trial transcript so far, we have seen the case for the Commonwealth of Virginia is not going very well against Dr. Taylor. We have also discovered some abnormalities in the trial transcripts themselves. One of the subtle abnormalities comes from the format of the testimonies of the Swindle Brothers and S.T. Smiths. Was this change of writing style deliberate or a clue for us to know that at one point the trial transcripts were changed to conceal the cover-up? Come with us as we ponder the possibilities. After the unreliable and disastrous testimony of Jane Mullins, quote, star witness for the prosecution, unquote, something changed. At first, this change might not have come easily to the eye, but with close examination of the transcript, you will notice that there is a strange change in the writing styles at the end of Jane's testimony. At first, this peculiar change in the transcript can easily be overlooked. But after much thought and discussion about what we know about the trial and what Johnson has told us about the trial transcripts, we have concluded that there are two possibilities for this strange and peculiar change. Either the typist that Charles A. Johnson had hired quit and then Johnson hired someone else to finish the book, or Mr. Johnson and his typist had copied the trial transcripts verbatim, as he previously stated. Then someone else prepared the rest of the trial's transcripts. As this is yet another strange oddity in the trial transcripts, we strongly believe that this change in writing style occurred when the transcript was being prepared by the court in Wise County. At the time, it was customary for the district and circuit court clerks to prepare the appeals, transcripts, and other evidence for the appellate courts. Today, this would be handled by the attorneys of the accused, but at the time of the Taylor trial, the defense would write out the exceptions or writs of error to the trial. The court would then order these exceptions be made part of the trial transcripts. However, in the Taylor trial, we know that there were 12 exceptions that were ordered to be made as part of the record, but these exceptions never made it to the appellate court. What's more is this peculiar change in writing style may yet be an additional evidence that the trial transcripts were edited for content before being sent to the appellate court. The question is, if this change in writing style is evidence of editing, who was the editor? Was it the writer who, from the start of the trial transcripts through the testimony of Jane, had written in a relaxed and informal manner? Or was it the writer that seems to have reported the rest of the witnesses for the prosecution in a very formal manner? Or could it be evidence of multiple editors? Thus far, each testimony had begun with the phrase, quote, the witness testified, unquote, and went on to the testimony. Now the reporting takes on a formal and official tone, starting with the phrase, quote, the witness testifies as follows, unquote. Each question still ends with a semicolon. In addition, the recorded testimony prior to this change contained a lot of he said and she said statements when the questions were asked. Now those questions are recorded in a more conversational way the way in which you would expect to hear if you were listening to someone answer questions from someone else. However, the trade-off in this is now the answers all seem to be either multifaceted or a collection of answers to questions along the same line of questioning. The Testimony of Doc Swindle, Witness for the Commonwealth The witness testifies as follows, quote, I live at the Pound and I know Dr. Taylor and Ira Mullins. I live 150 yards from Ira Mullins' house, and I saw him Sunday before he was killed. Dr. M.B. Taylor stayed all night at my house on Saturday night before Ira Mullins was killed, and he asked me about Ira and said that Ira had offered for his life. I was in bed when he came to my house. He asked me to get up and come with him out on the porch, and he wanted to talk to me. He said that sometime after Ira had offered the reward to have him, that's Taylor, killed, someone had shot into his, Ira's, bed. But it, quote, wasn't me, unquote, and laughed. He said there was aiming to come up big trouble and that the Fleming boys would not bother me and Colonel Swindle anymore, and that he had that fixed, unquote. Quote, he asked me if there was anyone I wanted put out of the way, 
And I said, I don't want anyone put out of the way unless it was somebody that wouldn't live under the law. And he said, what about Martin Sowers and Ira Mullins? Martin Sowers and me had some trouble. And I told him I thought Ira Mullins was a very good neighbor and I don't know much about him, unquote. Quote, he told me to keep Martin Sowers and Ira Mullins located until the trouble came up. That he would be at my house every other night until the trouble came up. I remember saying something about Henry Hall in this connection. Mr. M.B. Taylor left my house before Ira Mullins started to Elkhorn. He said something about Ira's dog being killed. If he had any gun or pistol, I did not see them. Unquote. Greg Swindle came to my house with him. There is a good deal of shooting around Donkey, where Ira Mullins and I live. I did not hear that Ira Mullins' house was shot into until I came to the Wise Courthouse some days afterwards. He said that there was a warrant out for the Fleming boys and they would not bother me anymore, unquote. This witness was then asked this question. This is what it said, quote, what trouble he, witness, referred to, unquote. And he answered that he supposed he had referred to the trouble between him the witness and the Flemings when he Taylor said quote, he had the trouble with the Flemings fixed unquote. the testimony of dr. Swindle is very hard to follow this could simply be because of the change in recording style or it might be an indication of something else Swindle testifies about three troubles one that he and Colonel Swindle had with the Fleming brothers Doc Taylor tells him that one has been fixed. Taylor asks about putting anyone out of the way and asks about Martin Sowers. In his answer, we learn that Swindle also had some trouble with Sowers. The third trouble is the first to be brought up in the testimony, and it has to do with Ira Mullins. This trouble is only testified to by Doc and Greg Swindle. The often told story sometimes says that this trouble had to do with a, quote, loose woman living in Ira's house, unquote. But whatever this trouble was, Taylor mentions it three times to the Swindle brothers. The odd thing about this trouble can be found in the question asked about it by the judge. Taylor had stated that, quote, there was aiming to come up big trouble, unquote. Taylor then tells Swindle not to worry about the trouble that he had fixed it with the Flemings because he, Taylor, had fixed it. Taylor then asks Swindle to keep an eye on Sowers, which makes no sense, and Mullins until the trouble comes up. Dr. Taylor also informs Swindle that he plans to come up to his Swindle's house every other night until the trouble came up. If this trouble was Swindle's trouble with the Flemings, it had been fixed. Why was Ira linked to the trouble coming up? Testimony of Craig Swindle, Witness for the Commonwealth The witness testifies as follows, quote, I live at the Pound. I knew Dr. Taylor. I last saw Dr. Taylor Sunday morning and also saw him Saturday night before. He and I went to Doc Swindle's last night from Clifton Robinson's. We got there about 10 o'clock at night. Dr. Taylor asked Doc Swindle if he wanted anybody put out of the way and asked him about Ira Mullins and Mart Sowers, unquote. Quote, he, Taylor, said that there was aiming to come up a big trouble and that he wanted Doc Swindle to keep them until the trouble came up. He said that he would be at Doc Swindle's house every night or every other night that week. He said as we came along that night that Ira Mullins had offered $300 to have him killed. When we got 15 steps of Doc Swindle's house, which was about 15 yards from Ira's house. This was about 10 o'clock at night. I don't know who raised the talk about Ira Mullins, me or Taylor. If Dr. Taylor was armed that night, I could not see any. I did not say anything about Henry Hall that I remember. I'm very forgetful. Don't if I would have remembered it if he had, unquote. At this point of the trial, we were at first going to end in the in-depth examination of the transcript for the rest of the witnesses for the prosecution. Instead, we're going to do a compilation 
of the testimony for the rest of the witnesses as apart from two of them. They are all going to testify to basically the same type of information about the sightings of Doc Taylor and the Fleming brothers before and after the Pound Gap Massacre. Summary of the Testimony of S.T. Smith, Witness for the Commonwealth However, on re-examination of the transcript, we discovered that after the testimony of S.T. Smith, the writing style in the recorded transcript changed once again, and several times thereafter. We felt the need to point this out with the inclusion of Smith's testimony, which occurs before the next change. Smith testifies to very little and once again leaves the reader wondering why the Commonwealth Attorney called him as a witness. The only information gained from his testimony is that we discovered that his name is Tom Smith. He is the brother-in-law of Doc Swindle and he visited Doc Taylor in jail. Taylor asked him if he knew of anything that would help him in this case. Taylor also inquired about Doc Swindle and asked Tom to pass on a message to Swindle. This message was to remember the help that Dr. Taylor had given to Swindle's brother and not to swear to too much against him. We think that this constant change of writing styles throughout the trial transcripts was important enough to bring up again. At this point, we will mention it when it occurs throughout the rest of the trial. We believe that these changes in writing styles are important when looking at the case in hindsight, especially when the lens of hindsight is gained from doing 10 years of research into the contradictions and mysteries which surround the Killing Rock and the Pound Gap Massacre. As we have stated, the format of these testimonies is different from the rest of those that have been previously given. The writing styles will change once again with more testimonies to come. These subtle differences have led us to the question of how accurate these testimonies were recorded for the appellate court, or if they had been changed by Charles A. Johnson himself. We will never know the answer as Johnson's copy of the trial is the only existing copy available to anyone. This may change, though, through the digitization of records. It is our hope that this will happen and that we can compare the evidence that is currently available. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our series on the Killing Rock. Don't forget when watching our videos to hit the like button, as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell for notification. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we bring to you the history of the Appalachian Mountains. We must remind everyone that the story names Killing Rock the Off-Told Tale, Killing Rock the Untold Story, and Killing Rock the Trial are all under the Kentucky Tennessee Living copyright.